everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Future of Democracy Part 2, Controlling the Vote. I'm Jessica, Program Manager for Greensboro Bound. Unfortunately, we were unable to capture this conversation in its entirety when it was originally broadcast. However, given the importance and the power of this conversation, we still wanted to share with you what we were able to capture. Our guests for this evening were Nancy McLean and Jean Nickel. Nancy is the author of Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America, which was a 2017 finalist for the National Book Award in Nonfiction. Nancy is an award-winning scholar of the 20th century U.S. and the William H. Chafe Distinguished Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. Jean is the author of Indecent Assembly, the North Carolina Legislature's Blueprint for the War on Democracy and Equality. He is the Boyd Tinsley Distinguished Professor of Law at UNC and a member of the Order of the Longleaf Pine, the highest award for state service granted by the Governor of North Carolina. He was the former director of the UNC Poverty Center until it was closed by the UNC Board of Governors for publishing articles critical of the then Governor and General Assembly. Our host for this evening was John Cox, Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies at UNC Charlotte. John is also the author of To Kill a People, Genocide in the 20th Century. All of these books and many, many more are available from our independent bookseller partner, Scuppernong Books, or the independent bookseller closest to you. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters of the Piedmont Triad for their help promoting this event. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. It influences public policy through education and advocacy. You can learn more about the League of Women Voters and find your local chapter at lwv.org. And one final note, the fellow that you'll see at the end of the video is Brian Lampkin, who is the president of the Board of Directors for Greensboro Bound, and he is also co-owner of Scuppernong Books. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Administration has also brought so many things that the Koch and Pope political right wanted, you know, from the tax uh, uh, benefits to the wealthiest at the expense of most of us, to the stopping of any action on the climate, because so many of these people are based in the fossil fuel industry, to, you know, many more things that I don't even want to go into because I don't want to take up all the time. But they're doing that because of that arch understanding of what liberty is, as opposed to our popular understanding of what freedom is. Okay, yeah, thank you, Nancy. I'm, I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> and for the audience, that wasn't even set up. <laughs> but that was, that's a, a powerful and an, even an inspiring answer. And uh, Gene, I'd like to ask you, if, if we could all be at the Scuppernong bookstore like we would like to, and we could buy y'all's two books there. And that's where y'all out there in the audience need to buy the books. Don't be buying them off Amazon. <laughs> but okay, if you do come up toward Boone, though, Foggy Pines needs a little help. So you can buy books from Foggy Pine online, but online, but don't be. <laughs> but uh, definitely support Scuppernong, support, uh, etc. Hey, uh, Jane, um, just yeah, uh, two blocks up the street from Scuppernong is of course the International Civil Rights Museum, where uh, fifty, uh, sixty years ago now, yeah, sixty years and about eight and eight months ago, four young guys walked down the street from A&T and they started a powerful powerful movement that really reinvigorated the civil rights movement led to a, 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 a regional eventually really a national movement of sit-ins and that's just kind of a reminder I guess that um, Greensboro and the state of North Carolina and of course this could be said probably about every state in this country but it has both histories of of horrible dreadful appalling things uh, and in fact, if it weren't for J uh, Jim Crow racism, then those four guys wouldn't have walked down there. But then also histories of powerful, inspiring ex uh, examples of resistance and dissent and rebellion and freedom struggles that we can learn from. And in fact, it was only three or four months after that that, uh, that SNCC was founded, the Southern Nonviolent mm -hmm. Coordinating Committee, uh, up in Raleigh at Shaw University by a native of North Carolina in Ella Baker. And Jane, I liked in your book where you shout out and remind people about people from North Carolina, like Ella Baker and Polly Murray. And uh, because I, I grew up when Jesse Helms was, <laughs> that's all anyone there around the country knew when I said I was from North Carolina. So anyway, yeah, let me just ask you to comment on these dual histories and on the importance of understanding the, you know, the real history, good and ill of North Carolina. 
Sure, thanks, John. Um, and let me just say a word about what Nancy just talked about uh, as well, uh, in that when I read Nancy's book uh, and these competing visions of liberty, what, what I was reminded of is Lincoln's little aphorism that the wolf and the sheep are not agreed on the definition of liberty, as he would put it. Uh, and that's a big uh, host of uh, what we've been treated to. The way it works out in North Carolina, of course, put us, putting aside any theoretical base, uh, is that the constant move of our state legislature in the last decade has been to uh, give tax cuts for the very wealthiest among us and then to wage war on low income people, literally. Um, uh, I could go through the long list of uh, uh, the, the crusade against the poor, starting with uh, uh, 500,000 people kicked off of Medicaid, us having, of course, the uh, largest cut to an unemployment compensation program uh, in American history, being the only state uh, in the United States to end its earned income tax credit, kicking uh, thousands and thousands of poor kids off of food stamps, ending uh, our modest appropriation to legal aid, raising the taxes of the bottom 40% in order to create huge largesse for those at the top. That's how it plays out here, um, a regime which is simply handing money constantly to the richest and, and literally strangling the poorest among us. But what John mentions on race is just something that needs to be thought about here. Um, I've, I've been told it's rude to say this and that uh, being a university professor, I shouldn't say it. Uh, but I do like to try and point out the racial makeup of the North Carolina legislature, just as a start. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've been governed by these uh, large Republican caucuses in each house, very large, frequently. Uh, they go into their closed sessions and uh, write the laws which become the standards for North Carolina. They are all white caucuses. Uh, so when they debate these policies, there is not a person of color in the room to raise uh, objection, even though, what, 22% uh, of Tar Heels are African American, 40% of us are uh, people of color. Uh, we are governed 150 years after the passage of the Equal Protection Clause by all white caucuses, by a white people's party. Uh, now, like I said, I've been told it's rude to say that. Apparently it's not rude to be a white people's party. That's okay, that's acceptable. But naming it is uh, forbidden. Now, what have they done when they go into their all white caucuses? They do just sort of what you would guess. Uh, they have uh, given us, the courts have said the largest racial gerrymanders ever confronted by a, an American court. They have famously used surgical precision to discriminate against black voters. They have done more faster, another federal court rule, than any other legislature in America to restrict the franchise. So the truth of it is, as the rest of the world goes about a modern reckoning, we hope, our Republicans have stuck with uh, racism, old school, uh, trying to build a bridge to 1953. We've got to ask if that's acceptable. Is it acceptable to be governed by a white people's party in 2020? Uh, as if uh, the clock had been turned back 75 years and we were happy with that. I wouldn't have thought that uh, race would be made a central component of a modern political party's agenda, uh, the desire to suppress African Americans, but that has happened consistently, uh, pervasively over the last decade. And the question is whether we're gonna put up with it, we're gonna, whether we're gonna allow ourselves to meet their goal, which is to sort of out Alabama, Alabama, and out Mississippi, Mississippi, and out Louisiana, Louisiana. Um, I don't think North Carolinians want that, 
Uh, I don't think they, that's what they signed up for, but it's what we're getting uh, and it's being done in our names and it's gonna continue to be done unless we stop it, we literally stop it. All right, thanks, Gene. And hey, y'all, so uh, the, the, yeah, this series of programs does a really good job of having kind of a like predictable beginning and ending points. And so we basically got about 20, 22 or 25 minutes to go. And so we definitely like to entertain some questions. And I'm looking at a couple right now in the chat box. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, Stephen has a question for, for, for Nancy, which is, it, uh, it seems as if uh, people like the Koch brothers and Art Pope and Buchanan uh, reject anything that's happened in this country, any kind of policies and so on from the new deal up to the present. Does, is that correct? Um, that is correct, but it's actually worse than that. Um, I, you know, they definitely, okay, emancipation. <laughs> um, they certainly embrace uh, the perversion of the 14th Amendment that Jean talked about after the defeat of Reconstruction. Um, railroad lawyers, you know, kind of took the 14th Amendment and turned it into a protection for corporate personhood. Um, so they clearly stand behind that set of ideas. Uh, and they're also, frankly, eager to roll back the progressive era. I know it's hard to believe, but I say this to you as a historian, they also uh, vehemently criticized the federal income tax, the 16th Amendment. Uh, they criticized the direct election of U.S. senators by the people. Um, so these folks are actually, while we're all paying attention to Trump's tweets over here, he kind of gets us over here, they're actually pushing for a constitutional convention under Article 5 of the Constitution to revise the U.S. Constitution to their liking. And one of of the so-called liberty amendments that has been proposed by one of these leading libertarians, a man named Mark Levin, you can find them on Wikipedia, actually would get rid of that progressive era victory of the direct election of US senators. Now, the reason that became an amendment in the progressive era is because state governments are the easiest branch of government for corporations to take over and control, as Gene shows so beautifully uh, in his book, which he you know, describes rightly in the subtitle title as a blueprint um, because they want to take this elsewhere. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we have to realize that they are actually aiming at 115 years of progressive victories. Now, they don't announce that. You know, they talk about liberty or they talk about limiting government or putting more of your tax dollars in your pocket. I know because I'm on the mailing list of Americans for Prosperity and the Convention of States. So I see what they send out and how they don't tell their own people the whole truth. But the whole truth that they admit in other venues and, and have, for example, on the radio, is that the purpose of such a constitutional convention would be to undo 115 years of progressivism. So Common Cause has called this push for an Article 5 convention the most serious threat to our democracy flying almost completely under the radar. So uh, yes, to the question, I believe Steve was the questioner, not only do they want to go back to before the New Deal, they also want to go back to before the Progressive Era, and also their their judicial appointments, by the way, are in this mold. So, you know, and Jean could talk about this, but and I don't want to get too wonky in the weeds. But the Commerce Clause of the Constitution and an interpretation of that that the Supreme Court accepted in 1937 is the basis for all federal regulation, right? That does all of the good things that we want government to do that are national. Well, many of these uh, uh, judicial candidates that they've chosen and people they've put on the bench don't think that was legitimate. So Clarence Thomas wants to go back to the pre-1937 constitution. He's very open about that, but so do these others. And I have to say just a little intervention here, you know, I was a reproductive rights activist. I started in women's history, but I think we're, we're doing ourselves and the nation a grave disservice to imagine that the only thing that is vulnerable with the uh, stealing of the seat from uh, Justice Ginsburg and not giving, allowing the next president to seat, seat that court. These folks are taking aim at the whole 20th century regulatory state. Um, and we need to really understand that if we are going to uh, effectively deal with it and think about what, what all, any response from the citizenry should be. So, yes. Nancy, let me just add, I, though my eyes did light up when you mentioned the Commerce Clause, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take folks down that arena. It, just to put in perspective, though, the war against 
the, the progressive era uh, and progressivism. Uh, they believe, in other words, that somehow we've done too much for those at the bottom. Now, that is in the United States right now, which is the richest nation on earth, uh, but also among the major uh, Western democracies has the most poverty uh, and far and away the most child poverty of the major nations so that we have become the richest, the poorest and the most unequal nation on earth. Some of you folks would have read uh, Thomas Piketty. Uh, Piketty wrote three years ago that economic inequality, the gaps between rich and poor in the United States is now greater than at any other place on earth at any time in human history. So when you're thinking about their view that we've done too much for poor people and not enough to coddle rich people, uh, they are saying in effect that being the worst in the world is not good enough. We still need to step on people's necks uh, and see if we can't do a little better to make poor people squirm and to give more largesse to uh, the very wealthiest among us. It's a stunning uh, approach to democratic government. Hey, well, that kind of takes us uh, uh, to the next question. This is a very interesting question and related to uh, really the question of how we ended up in this, <laughs> where we are in this state and in this country right now, which it's, it's definitely long seemed to me that uh, a central part of that is the the ability of white supremacy and racism to undermine the possibilities of unity among poor folks and working class people, and which is a big reason why we don't have a much stronger labor movement than we do in this country. Fortunately, we do have a labor movement, and North Carolina is not completely the most anti-labor non-union state ever. There was a wonderful victory for labor a week and a half ago in Asheville at Mission Hospital, uh, which is about the only good thing that's happened in the year 2020, okay, uh, of the National Nurses United Union. Okay, so this question though is definitely related to, is, is really I think for either or both of y'all. And uh, F. Wilson uh, uh, points to a recent book by Eduardo Porter called American Poison about how Americans reacted to great society programs and the, the you know, Johnson years um, by not only turning against efforts for equality, but by pretty much turning against government entirely which is a big theme of, uh, of Nancy's book. But by doing so, they did not only undermine the uh, 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 safety net that they themselves now desperately need, because now many white Americans are so economically threatened, um, et cetera. And uh, do you see any significant turnaround in the attitudes of these white Americans who fall into the lower rungs of the economic ladder? And then I think you, also part of the question implied is to folks who fall, who are willing to listen to, to populists, to right-wing populists, the word populism is misused often, but to right-wing populists, et cetera. Let, let me just say two quick things, because then this is really Gene's bailiwick um, with all the work that he's done with uh, Reverend Barber in the World Mondays movement and all across North Carolina um, with the poverty tour and, and so forth. But I want to say too, that I, the people, kind of people I write about, it really benefits them to have us divided, right? And to think in tribal terms and to think that all, you know, for, for, for people who are for racial justice, to think that all these white people, you know, are, are, are the enemy or are not helping. And it's actually just not true. I actually just read a brilliant uh, piece by um, the economic historian, Gavin Wright, a new piece of work in which he was pointing out that white, working class whites did not leave the, the Democratic Party in the South, at least on like state level voting. Uh, right after the Civil Rights Act, as the myth implies. In fact, they left in large numbers after NAFTA, after they lost all their jobs, and the Clinton administration and others in the, the top of the Democratic Party then were not really standing up for jobs and for working people. So I think it's a more, uh, it's a more complex story. Um, at the same time, I think racism is the worst poison, um, and it is used very effectively by this political right, leveraged 
consciously and strategically in order to divide us. And uh, no one can tell us more about how that's done or uh, how it's worked out in North Carolina than Gene. So then I'll pass the, the floor back to I read uh, Eduardo's book and it's terrific and very powerfully done. So I recommend it too. Uh, but it's, it's also clear, uh, consistent with that, that there, there's no greater kinship on any front in North Carolina than the kinship between race and poverty. Uh, it has uh, been our strongest link, the greatest marriage since the first day of our history until uh, this morning, uh, and it uh, continues. Uh, <coughs> when you look at poverty in North Carolina, it is hugely skewed according to race. Uh, I have a chapter on race and poverty, and. One of the things that surprised me a little bit, consistent with what uh, the questioner and John have brought up, uh, looking at the uh, social sciences research, is uh, th there's very powerful evidence that the reason the United States has such a weakened uh, uh, welfare system or structure of uh, uh, protections for the poor is because unlike other Western nations, we so heavily racialize the questions of uh, uh, poverty. Uh, in Europe, uh, if you're poor, people are inclined to think you're unfortunate and maybe could use uh, a hand up. In the United States, we racialize that and uh, decide as a people that poor people are unworthy. Uh, and that linkage, which has left poor white folks uh, to work against their own economic interests for, uh, in terms of politics for the last 200 years, particularly in the South, it is the story of the South, the, the literal defining story of the South, uh, plagues us dramatically. Let me just say this, last two years ago, I guess, uh, my students and I did a lot of interviews uh, like we do all across North Carolina, but at the same time, we were interviewing low-income folks in Goldsboro and in Wilkesboro. Um, different kinds of poverty, both uh, uh, intergenerational poverty, very powerful, chronic poverty. Uh, in uh, uh, Goldsboro, uh, most everyone we interviewed was uh, Black or uh, Latino. Uh, in Wilkes, uh, more Appalachian poverty. Uh, uh, almost all white, but still extreme levels of poverty. Uh, those folks would not have considered themselves colleagues or uh, uh, teammates. Uh, uh, the, the poor folks in Wilkes tended to have Trump uh, signs out front and a Confederate flag on their mobile home. And that certainly was not true of the low income folks in Goldsboro. But we also asked them to fill out these questionnaires and we interviewed them uh, on a specific set of questions related to what they wish would happen, what their aspirations are, what they wish uh, that their communities could help them do and the like. And their answers, the black people in Goldsboro and the poor white folks in uh, Wilkes were almost identical. Um, they wouldn't have regarded themselves as allies, but if anyone could ever was ever smart enough to help them see how much they have in common, uh, so that if they could lock home, lock arms, it would defeat the uh, art popes uh, of North Carolina. It would fix our politics, and it would mean that we would no longer take the economic interest of the bottom 55 percent of North Carolinians off of our political agenda like we do right now. Right on, thanks Gene. And I think we only, we probably have approximately 10 minutes and, uh, and toward the end of that time, um, Brian's gonna say a few words. So let me ask this final question. This is a great question from a couple of different people asked the same question for, for both of y'all. The question is, how do we fight back? 
The all important question. Thank you for that. Um, I see from Anna, I, didn't, I didn't see, can't see the other ones, but uh, thank you that we, we really need to address that. Um, the single most important thing that we can do about the problem that I talk about in, in my book, this kind of integrated strategy coming from these wealthy donors on the right, and the, again, literally hundreds of organizations they fund, including campus outposts at places across North Carolina, at my own university, Duke, I'm sad to say, at Jeans, UN. NC, uh, Western North Carolina, Wake Forest, there's Coke money in all of those. <laughs> so we could do something about that. But ultimately, I think the crucial thing that we need to do is push for structural democracy reform. Because if we do that, we cut this off you know, right, you know, it's like cutting the cobra off or something, right? If we were to have uh, automatic voter registration, if we were to have independent redistricting so voters could choose their legislators rather than this minority party choosing their voters, if we were to stop these uh, attacks on the legal rights of labor unions and particularly public sector unions they've really gone after because those are the most powerful, you know, in today's America and teachers unions, you know, if we were to support the right of people to organize collectively uh, for collective voice, those things, uh, transparency in political money, you know, it's the dark money that is totally polluting our system. Uh, so I'm really uh, happy to share that uh, in recent years, and ironically, since this current administration woke so many people up, those are on the top of the agenda of so many uh, democracy reform groups, you know, and so many groups that are not necessarily democracy reform. Greenpeace is working for these things. You know, civil rights groups are working for them. Planned Parenthood is working for them. The NAACP. So I think there is really a sense from people who are active in the political process that structural democracy reform is no longer something for the good government folks to do, you know, on the side. This has got to be central on everyone's agenda to reclaim democracy so that it works for us. So I think that, you know, to me is the key thing. I think we all understand that the election we're faced with right now is the most pivotal probably since 1864 or 1860. Um, it is democracy is under threat and under strain in this country like never before. Um, the president is the most obvious and I think Mitch McConnell and others are angry at him because he says things out loud while they are trying to, to essentially rig the election in other ways, you know, undermining the post office, creating these legal challenges, you know, rigging the electoral commissions, all these other things. So we have got to be really mindful and we've got to ensure that we have an absolutely huge thumping turnout uh, in this election. It has got to be over 60% if we want to save democracy. That is a high bar in the US and it's going to be even higher with COVID. But we, you know, if you're not phone banking now, if you're not talking to your neighbors and getting out the vote, we have got to because there is a, a national uh, task force on um, the uh, transition. You may have heard about it, its work, but they actually did, had Democrats and Republicans, you know, the Republicans that would talk to them, uh, and all kinds of experts, including military, do war gaming to understand what were the potential, what were the threats in this election to our country and to our system. And the, of the four scenarios that they had, the only one that did not result in constitutional crisis and the potential for violence was an absolutely huge turnout and a very clear uh, victory for sorry, but the party of democracy at this point. Uh, so I think we've all got our work cut out for us, but in all of our communities, there are really great people who are doing vitally important work who would welcome volunteer uh, support. And um, if you don't have the time, you can always you know, give what you can in the way of money. But I think we all have to really roll up our sleeves and realize this is an all hands on deck emergency for democracy in our country. And if we value the things that have come from democracy, then we have to be part of fixing it and also making it functional so that we can achieve all the things that we need to achieve for the 21st century that have been bottled up, not least saving our planet um, and our common welfare. Um, let me say the boy, one thing I certainly agree with that Nancy said is if there's ever been a time that it's all hands on deck, this mm -hmm. is it, uh, this very minute. I've lived an odd sort of life. I uh, came from the wrong side of the tracks, but I was eventually a law school dean for a long time and a university president, uh, which I mention only to say, during that time, I got to know a lot of rich people. That's what university presidents and uh, law school deans do. I thought sometimes, I've thought sometimes in my life that uh, 
if you could just convince wealthy people to be more generous, that that's a potent way of solving some of the economic problems uh, that we have. Uh, and I'm a constitutional lawyer by trade. That makes me something of a proceduralist, uh, uh, sort of like Common Cause or the League of Women Voters are. Uh, but uh, in my old age, uh, and that would needs to include the last 25 years as well, uh, I don't believe those things so much anymore. What I believe is uh, what Frederick Douglass said, is nothing gives way except with the struggle. And the only thing that's going to uh, happen that's going to change our fate is not uh, good government folks or new great uh, policies or generosity from uh, uh, wealthy people. But when the bottom 65% of uh, folks in the United States recognize that this is a democracy and that they, they're able to rule it, they're actually able to govern. Uh, there's nothing natural. Jesus didn't declare that the bottom 75% don't count. I think his view was perhaps uh, literally the opposite. The only thing that will actually save North Carolina and save the democracy of the United States is uh, engagement organization in great numbers. Nancy is right that it's got, you, you, can't, you can't depend on 55%. You ought to be able to, in a democracy, 55% would work, but we need 60, 65% uh, so that we can return government to its uh, democratic shoals. Uh, uh, nothing else is going to uh, result in that. Uh, I've, I've talked a lot with these folks, argued with them. You're not going to convince them to do the right thing. There's nothing to do but outnumber them, beat them, reject them from power, determine that they're unfit to govern, and send them back to whatever uh, holes they uh, uh, came from. Uh, that's all that will work, uh, but it's literally what is called for right now. Robert Kennedy said in 1966, when he was a boulder, uh, it was in Berkeley, I mean, the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage in a personal commitment to the ideals and the enterprises of the American democracy. He was, describing what he thought was the world unfolding around it. But for us, those words are a manifesto and a prayer, and they have to be, this month, a call to arms. Okay, I, I think it's probably, uh, I think Brian is probably gonna come in now and say a, a word or two. I just wanna thank in my role as host of this, just you know, uh, thank the two authors for such a really stimulating and and real, you know, powerful sets of remarks. You've, uh, if if uh, everyone else out there hasn't bought y'all's books, I'm sure they will now. And uh, you've gave us a hell of a lot to think about. If I may use a, a small profanity in this venue, and um, but also really, uh, yeah. yeah you you both are inspiring examples of, of that, that there is hope, <laughs> you because know? there are a lot of there are a lot of people out there, a lot of people whose names we'll never know. You know what? In the civil rights in the in the sit-in movement, there's another little college. Uh, there, well, A and T is not a little college, but there is a little college called Bennett, a few blocks on, uh, in another direction from Scuppernong Books. There's a lot of young women from Bennett came down there and really reinforced the sit-ins in February 1960. And a lot of young women whose names will never and faces, ne, you know, never became famous. But so, um, which is just a way of saying that there are small and large ways of being part of a movement or of movements to not only defend and expand democracy, but to fight for human rights on many, many fronts. Okay. So anyway, th thanks very much to the authors and, and yeah. to Brian for organizing this. Thank you, John. Yeah, and all three of you, what a rousing call to arms that was. Like, this is an hour that at least inspires me, and I suspect our entire audience. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, obviously, we wanted to do this in person at a Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. COVID intervened. We are planning a May festival for 2021. We fully expect that to be a virtual festival as well, but we will still live with some hope for in-person events. Um, all of our events are always 100% free to our community. 
And it's folks like you who are passionate about books, reading and writing who make Greensboro Bound and these events possible. We'd love for you to stay in touch with us. You know, you can um, join us on Instagram or Facebook or all the usual social media places. Go to our website, greensboroboundcom um, please, if you thought this was an amazing event, and it was, tell your friends, tell them to, you know, join into our uh, Zoom events. Our next one is uh, Friday, October 9th at 7 p.m., uh, Voting for Racial Justice. We'll be talking with Dr. Omar Ali, author of Imbalance of Power, Independent Black Politics and Third Party Movements in the United States and Lekha Shupak, North Carolina State Director for All on the Line, a grassroots campaign to bring citizens across every issue together to win on redistricting in 2021. Um, yeah, I'm just so inspired by this idea of uh, communities working together. Um, you know, we gotta find a way to do it. And I guess we start by getting out the vote. Um, I hope this event encourages us all to work hard at that. It's encouraged me. Um, I guess I should say one last thing. Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization. <laughs> there are ways to donate to Greensboro Bound as well. Go to our uh, Facebook page or our website and you can just press a button and donate to Greensboro Bound. Indecent Assembly, Gene Nickel, published by Blair. I should mention Blair, a small press in Durham, North Carolina. It does great work. Um, amazing book, important book. Democracy and Chains. I have a hardcover here, but you can get the paperback now, Nancy. It's probably $17. Um, really important work. What a great night. Thank you, all three of you, Jean, Nancy, John, and everyone. Have a great night out there. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, and John, thanks for being such a great host. <laughs> it's great to be with you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>